right here is Asaf Ashkenazi. He's the Chief, Chief Strategy Officer of Inside Secure. Uh, then we have Tim Junio, who is the CEO and founder of Expanse. And at the end, we have Nicole Egan, who is the CEO of Darktrace. So, Tim, I want to start out with you. Um, there's expected to be IoT devices in the home and office over the next few years, a predicted 20 billion or more devices. So what concerns you the most about this from a cyber perspective, and how does Expanse fit into this? Uh, so we've been seeing the explosion of IoT devices for some time. That's not news. Uh, what we think is happening with 5G is the acceleration of that putting of an internet protocol address in everything, and then the increased speeds that we're uh, associating with 5G, what we're expecting is going to happen, uh, changes what you can do as an attacker. Uh, so if you think of something as simple as uh, plugging a data exfiltration device into a corporate network, something that is a recurring problem and physical security tries to deal with, uh, your burst transmission of trying to get data out is suddenly going to be much faster in a single effort when you're talking about a 5G network. So when you're trying to just think of, even in the classic attack models of how do people do cyber operations, in that case that's human enabled, but it's also technology enabled, and a really small radio that you can put in anywhere within a network all of a sudden has a tremendous amount of capacity that might have previously been much lower latency. Uh, what you're seeing in the media is more around the nation state level risks associated with 5G, which is a question of who owns the network, who can control the traffic, and I think the real risks there are actually not yet borne out in the sense of uh, we're uh, going to observe encryption just like we do all over the place where insecure networks could actually carry secure traffic. And so I think the real question is going to be, even if you have risks in the backbone, uh, what can an attacker actually do if we're doing a good job as private companies in providing security over those networks? So I would say those are two extremes of the spectrum and all kinds of things are falling uh, along them from enabling classic attacks all the way through the shaping of the new infrastructure infrastructure might enable new opportunities for doing uh, cyber espionage and other operations. Uh, Expense fits in by finding every device that's on the global internet, and so we're mapping the spread of IoT in real time in the explosion of assets and making sure for companies as they're going through digital transformation and have anybody in the business, like your marketing org today, could stand up something in a cloud service or themselves be using 5G-enabled IoT in the future, uh, make sure that the core corporate headquarters and central CIO uh, kind of staff understand what's happening across the network space. And Nicole, I want to understand a little bit more about what Darktrace does. I know that you've modeled some of your algorithms around how a virus spreads in the human body. Yeah, we use artificial intelligence to emulate um, the human body's immune system. So if you think about the human body, it's under attack all the time by viruses, bacteria, um, and occasionally one of those gets inside. And so we actually have created a system using machine learning to understand the inside of a company. Uh, every person, every device, all of the data that's flowing, either in the network, in the cloud, across these IoT devices. And we understand when all of a sudden they start behaving unusually. And the AI is actually absolutely able to not only detect that threat, but stop it in real time in its tracks. Um, you know, we heard some of the other panelists this morning talking about how it is impossible to just do this with humans. Uh, and especially when you get into IoT environments, smart cities with lots of sensor data, just the attack surfaces are too large, the attacks move too quickly. So being able to use AI uh, really makes a difference and, and gives the, uh, uh, the good guys kind of a, a real fighting chance. And so who are your clients and what are some of the biggest risks that you've seen or the biggest hacks that you've prevented? Yeah. You know, I think we, we literally stop um, attacks every day, and I know, you know, with 5G, we are going to see more IoT devices. And one of the things that we see is attackers just scan the networks every day looking for these insecure IoT devices. And I think that problem is just going to get worse uh, as we get more devices and more 5G. And, you know, employees don't remember to tell the IT team or the security team that they're bringing in the Alexa, that they've plugged in an internet-connected cappuccino maker, video conferencing equipment, um, all of a sudden, all of this uh, uh, IT-connected building automation security. I mean, it's, and people even just bring their Alexa in, you know, and say, well, I can now talk to Salesforce.com through my Alexa, so why not?
So um, we are seeing every day these attackers scanning the networks, finding the default passwords haven't been changed, and they're using this as a jumping off point into the corporate network to get to more important, more interesting data. Um, we actually see out of our 3,000 customers, we've already blocked IoT attacks at about a third of those. And again, it's, it's exponentially growing. Um, so it's, uh, it is a real problem. And I think with 5G, you also get just more issues around user privacy, um, lack of trust. But most importantly, I think also, it brings together the physical world and the cyber world. And so the threats where it's still really important that we protect data, but what happens when that transcends now into the physical world and whether it be people put at risk um, or just physical infrastructure, I think that's gonna be the biggest shift we see in the attacks. And Asaf, jumping on what Nicole just spoke about in terms of the attack surface increasing, you have your Alexa, internet connected cappuccino devices. What do you see as the biggest risk with 5G and how does your company help protect companies against that? So I think that the, the biggest risk in uh, using Nicole's uh, example, you think about in 5G, if you had like few people in a town, suddenly you will have millions of millions of people in a city that is very dense. So if you have a virus now, it can spread faster, it's easier to get. And you know, people think that hackers are very, very sophisticated, but actually they are quite lazy. They are looking for the link, the weakest link or these uh, people that is more vulnerable to get the virus and gets through them. So I think that uh, 5G will bring two things. First is the amount of these devices, which increase the attack surface, which is make it much more difficult to control and know what these devices are doing. And the other thing is the physical aspect that Nicole talked about today, it's just in an infancy, right? So if an attack is coming on a device that is, let's say, uh, controlling a garage door, the, the, the worst thing that can happen, the garage door will open. But with 5G, there are new use cases that will come. Uh, if you think about uh, automotive and the connected car, and how the car will talk to other cars and to other infrastructure. Um, this has a potential damage that is much, much bigger than what we see uh, today. There was actually a, a report that broke this morning actually about um, breaking into actually GPS devices in connected cars. And it, it didn't happen in the US, it was actually across India, uh, South Africa. Uh, and basically attacker, you said how they can be kind of lazy, they'll take the easiest route. Um, he actually broke into these two GPS providers um, that actually did impact over 100,000 vehicles, and it was because the default password was 123456. And he actually figured out through breaking in, he could stop the vehicles if they were, he could shut off the engines if they were going 12 miles per hour or less. How so, does a company take a proactive approach though? I mean, it's inevitable that everybody is connected to tons of devices and sensitive information. It's unclear what's being protected and what's not. Well, this is, I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons that today's approaches just won't work, right? So one is that it's impossible to think about writing a security rule for all of these different scenarios, um, especially with the flood of new devices coming on. Uh, the other old technique was matching signatures of historical attacks. The attackers keep changing uh, their approach, right? So that really isn't sufficient either. So I think you know, the point of having to use machine learning or AI to understand normal, detect and stop these things in real time, and you can't rely necessarily on putting agents in every device. It's one thing, we've seen agents on smartphones, but there's a lot more commonality mm -hmm. across smartphones. When you get into industrial control systems, some of these IoT devices, I think we also may have to move away from that agent kind of mentality. And Tim, your customers own more than 10% of the global internet, and you have customers like CVS and PayPal. So for the, these big corporations, where do you see the key vulnerabilities, and how can smaller companies learn from that? So I think the biggest problem for really large organizations is just knowing what's happening. 
and anyone who's an IT professional in the room understands this intuitively, uh, this decentralization of IT, such that you can use a credit card to buy something cheaply and easily, has spread everywhere in every department, uh, everywhere in the world, every type of company and every department within your company. So uh, I would ask uh, the question of, do you know or have any way of knowing if a regional office leases a connection from a local ISP? And when you look at something like 5G, uh, further enabled mobile technology, it just means that connectivity is going to be available anywhere and there is a loss of central visibility and control. So I think Nicole's point uh, related to mobile and operating systems is an interesting one to talk about how things are getting more secure in some areas. So even though from the cybersecurity industry you hear a lot of pessimism, one of the things that I think has been promising is the building in of security in products from the beginning and that's actually been pretty effective in some categories. You don't see headlines all the time about iPhones getting hacked, you actually see the opposite. The FBI unable to hack into an iPhone, for example. Um, and Alexas are not being eavesdropped on by people all over the world, or at least not yet. So I think that the uh, security by design into products is one of the things that's going to help the most, because Nicole's absolutely right. You can't install a custom piece of software on every type of IoT device that exists in the world. So we've got a very cool trend right now where companies are doing a better job out of the gate. And then for large organizations like my kinds of customers, when they set up IT to begin with, they're now moving in the direction of having security from the beginning and how those devices are provisioned. But are you confident that the threat and the hackers can't move faster than how these companies are building the security into their own products? Uh, I think the biggest risk is if you think of everything in the world that's going to be connected to the internet, you've got a very long tail. And this other point was absolutely correct regarding looking for the target of opportunity, the cheapest, easiest way to get in. So even if you have lots of great control from product manufacturers and your IT staff, if somebody buys a cheap webcam uh, because it's cheap, uh, and it's made by some company you've never heard of, uh, what are the odds that their product security is anywhere close to as good as a modern device from a company like Apple or Google? So I would personally put my bet, and I do actually, on Google to manage my personal email. I think they're going to do a great job. But I would worry a lot about the long tail of everything else that's out there that's not going to be on par. And that is exactly where you're going to start to see those risks uh, to get into corporate networks and to get to sensitive data. Because with devices everywhere, if you have 20 different things in an office environment, you're absolutely right. You just need one weak link. I think so far, all the attacks that we've seen and we've been talking about up here, most of these have been humans' hands on keyboards. And we think that is going to shift. We've already seen early signs of the attackers using AI and machine learning to learn the network, to blend better in, to be harder to detect. But the whole attack vector hasn't shifted yet to sophisticated AI. So I think one thing we do have to be prepared for is when that vector shifts and what is that going to look like. Because we expect it is going to become a full-on kind of war of algorithms, right? So you know, whoever algorithms are stronger, um, you know, whether it's on the defender side or the attacker side, that's what it's going to come down to. So I think everything we know today, for better or worse, could shift. And the question is, where will that happen in conjunction with the broad deployment of 5G? And Asaf, do you think those implementing large-scale industrial projects or smart city projects are putting enough emphasis on security from the outset? I mean, what sort of checks and balances do they need to think about? Yeah, so they need to think about the things today. So, for example, in the project that I saw that they put a, a sensor in the sewage, right? It's not something that's easy to replace, right? So it will be there for many years. So they need to think and prepare for the future and how do you update the software there? How do you uh, renew these devices when there are cyber attacks? But I think that one interesting thing is everybody talk about the vulnerabilities of the 5G uh, and what risk it will bring, but it also brings opportunities in terms of security. Uh, for example, we have uh, uh, 1,200 customers in more than 100 countries. We get a lot of data. It's very difficult to sometimes to get the data in different places and how much, and you're very limited in the amount of data that you can get in order to assess the security in the field. With 5G, with the uh, low latency and the bandwidth and the ability to be always connected, while it gives the attackers the opportunity, it also gives us better visibility into the networks and to see what anomalies happen and react in real time before the attack 
uh, actually cause any damage. So they are also positive uh, parts of the uh, 5G technology for security. Do you think there's a level of regulation that is needed in order to make sure that these large projects are adhering to you know, a certain level of standards? I think that regulation is still behind for uh, IoT. And um, the problem, and it's always like that, regulations and laws are behind technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as technology accelerates, that's become a bigger problem. So we see some uh, best practices that uh, uh, different governments uh, impose or suggest. But until it will be uh, more strict, I think that um, that will be a problem. Because if I'm a manufacturer of device and I need to add security to that, that adds to my cost. Mm -hmm. And if my competitor is not doing it, he has an advantage in the market. And if there is no, nothing that forces us to at least get to a certain level, there will be always the people that will take the shortcut and will make the, the organization or companies that make the extra effort as a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So, Tim, earlier you were talking about having confidence in a company's products from Apple or Google in terms of versus buying a cheap webcam. But I noticed you didn't mention Facebook or Amazon. And obviously, Facebook has, a lot, has had a lot of data breaches, and they're also creating more IoT-connected devices. So I guess my question is, should corporations readily and willingly trust these big tech giants in terms of keeping their data secure as they create more products that we can't even imagine today? I actually uh, would say I, I still you have to pick, right, because any embedded uh, device or complicated software product has risks of there being uh, issues within the software. But if you're picking uh, this GPS example that Nicole referenced earlier, uh, that was a company I'd actually not heard of before. Had you heard of them before, uh, before that article came out? Uh, that was, yeah, iTrack and ProTrack, and of course the underlying technology was from China. But powering it. Um, so that, and, know, the, and the reality is many devices, right? A lot of our devices are not all going to be produced and components are not all going to be produced in the U.S. So if you're deciding between would I trust Google Maps with my location data and control of things in physical space versus a much smaller company, I think the incentives are way more aligned with a global brand such as that as well as the resources where they can pay uh, outrageous amounts of money to get the absolute best product security engineering talent. Uh, and because of the distributed nature of the network, they have monitoring that exceeds uh, almost anybody else on the planet. So I would, I would still uh, put my money on Amazon and Facebook too, <laughs> uh, <laughs> over a new product company. And that's going to be interesting because we're seeing all kinds of new products that are being developed in a world of higher wireless bandwidth. And I think security from the beginning is not how startups in the Valley operate. Uh, and you end up playing catch up after some period of time. And I'm sure all the big tech giants had to do this too. And Nicole, bouncing off what we were talking about earlier, you mentioned the supply chain is very complex. A lot of the components are made all around the world. How does that play into the growing complexity of these threats? I mean, you can't help but have the supply chain all around the world. There's no way around it. That's absolutely right. And I think that it, it does complicate the issue. And we've been working uh, with certain sectors. One is the semiconductor industry, because they're all interconnected. They all rely on one another. And trying to figure out how to, I mean, what we've seen is up until now, it's been done through legal agreements. Right, So the lawyers make sure that there's something in writing. And I think it gives people somehow a peace of mind. But the reality is it's kind of separate from the technology uh, and how it's implemented. So I think the same level of visibility that we're giving companies into their own infrastructure, which, you know, again, they, they need that to start, we're going to have to figure out how to extend type of, some type of visibility and maybe even real-time risk assessment or um, key components in the supply chain. Um, and that's early days yet. Uh, and I think it is an important part. And I think also just you extend all of the components that are in that device, right? Where were they manufactured? Where are the vulnerabilities? Not in the hardware, but the software. So you have to worry about device level security. You have to then extend to the cloud. And sometimes cloud providers sub out to other cloud providers. So you've got to look at the whole cloud connectivity. Then you've got to get to the data level, and then you have to get finally to the, the personal and user level. So there's, I think when we say 5G security, it's not only protecting the 5G network, it's you really have to look at even that supply chain 
and start to make sure that you've got um, security at all those different levels thought through. Well, I'd actually like to pose this question to all three of you in terms of where you're seeing the greatest risks. Is it from nation-state-sponsored hackers? Is it from cyber criminals? Is there a particular growth of threat from a particular group? So maybe go down the line. So I think that uh, if you look at it, nation or not nation uh, uh, sponsor, it starts sometimes with a nation sponsored. And this is the problem. It starts with a nation sponsored, and then the attack is being discovered at some point, and then people start to use it, which are not necessarily nation sponsored. And they have a very powerful weapon. So in the past, if you look at physical weapons, you could somehow contain them after government released this weapon. But once you release a cyber attack, a cyber weapon, it's very difficult to put it back, back in the bottle and, and, and contain it. And then you have other groups that get access to these very um, dangerous tools. And again, when we are talking about more connectivity, more complexity, uh, it means that there are more opportunity to attack and more opportunity to disrupt our life, whether it's on uh, uh, the cyberspace in terms of data and uh, 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 cause problem there, but also in the physical space when we talk about infrastructure. I think the uh, area of greatest risk I'd put in a category, which is long-term economic competitiveness. And the reason I say that is on the nation state side, it's not quite clear yet uh, what is being done with the stolen data and where we see it end up except in markets uh, and with products. So think about the OPM data uh, that was stolen based on US clearance holders, security clearance holders, people who work in the US government. Uh, where did those data go? It was never dumped anywhere publicly. Somebody's got it and they're sitting on it. And of course the question is why and what are they gonna do with it? Uh, I would speculate that if it is in fact China, the intent long-term is to limit mobility of people from US military and government from the intelligence community physically within China. And that's not you know, world-ending stuff. That's how intelligence has always functioned. You try to figure out who the people are and stop them from getting into your country. And if they're in your country, follow them and see who they meet with. So that's not where we're seeing the crazy outsized threats. Uh, an example of a crazy out outsized threat might be critical infrastructure exposures that nation states are holding onto. But then you need some kind of political context within which they would be used for coercion. And we haven't seen that at a large scale yet. The most destructive activity has been like what happened to Sony, for example, or the attacks against Merck and Maersk. And those are costly, but I think the long-term cumulative cost of industrial espionage is many times greater than what we have seen from destructive cyber attacks. So I would actually put my you know, chips on that category as the area where we need to most uh, focus and we're going to continue to see the greatest risk because that's where we're actually having material consequences that can be measured uh, in the private sector and for the United States as a country in terms of long-term strategic competition and what we can build and export. Yeah, I think one way to look at it is there are going to be all these different attack vectors. You know, we, we hear a lot right now about phishing attacks, social engineering. Um, I think the way to think about it is assume the attacker either is already inside or is going to get inside. Whether that is an employee, malicious or non-malicious, whether that is an embedded device that's sitting somewhere in a manufacturing plant floor or inside your environment. So the real way to maybe change this is don't maybe think only about the attacker and the attack vector. Assume it's inside and figure out and understand how fast can you identify it and stop it in its tracks before any damage is done. So I think that's the biggest shift we have to think of regardless of attacker or attack vector. And Tim, I want to touch a little bit on what you said earlier. In the first panel, we talked about sort of the politicization of 5G, and it's very much uh, national goals to be, every country to be first to the race. And so how should we make sense of the headlines around Huawei and the concerns of certain countries getting ahead? Is this a real cyber threat? Is it more of uh, corporations and a certain company wanting to get ahead? How should we make sense of it? Yeah, so my answer will begin with a bit of a hedge, which is simultaneously we haven't seen 
the evidence yet that is compelling that there's actually some kind of nefarious collaboration between Huawei and the Chinese government, or at least if it exists, I'm unaware of it. Usually the arguments uh, pertain to the Chinese government having a legal system that requires uh, assistance to the state intelligence and military apparatus, and uh, unknown what that has actually led to. Um, but the hedges, I think the, the risk is actually real. So despite the fact that we haven't seen a smoking gun, uh, if you do control the physical physical infrastructure, uh, that creates a lot of opportunities where on a long time horizon, as Asaf said earlier, uh, embedded systems need to plan to stick around for a while. Uh, it is incredibly difficult to think of a governance system whereby if Huawei is able to do over-the-air updates, uh, we can validate that every future software version does not have anything in it that could be detrimental to U.S. national security. So I would say that the, the risk is real, and uh, the question is what exactly is going to be done about it, because having an ombudsman or something like that doesn't seem like a reasonable approach, trying to evaluate every piece of software, every update, uh, to see if it has security flaws uh, is almost certainly not going to be an effective method. So I think when we also consider what does it mean for 5G in particular, uh, there seems to be some exceptionalism in how people comment on 5G. I just want to highlight the reason, for my, as I best understand it, is just that it's new, and when you're building from the start, uh, you have a lot of control over the physical systems and therefore the future software, because software and hardware are coming together. Um, and that's really where the threat is coming from. It's not a specific, like 5G itself cannot be made secure or cannot handle secure communications. So as I mentioned earlier, you can still encrypt communications over all kinds of different media, and if you believe in math, uh, math is pretty good, uh, then you should have confidence that you could have secure communications. Our own government does this by putting classified communications over commercial fiber optic uh, networks. That's something that has been done for a long time. Saf, you talked about this a little bit about this earlier, but what are some of the benefits in terms of security with the 5G rollout? How can it be more secure than what's been before? So I think uh, uh, going to what Nicole said, that it, there is a, a change of concept that we need to do in security. In the past, it was a perimeter, and we said, OK, I trust the device. It's in my network. I don't trust it. It's outside of my network. Now, um, there is no really a perimeter. It's everywhere. And um, the only way to operate is to know what's going on and to assume that you trust no one. So you accept these devices, but then you need to know what's going on in the field, how they behave, and look for these anomalies of uh, the beginning of attack. Um, the faster you know, the faster you can see a pattern and learn about it, um, the better chances you have to stop the attack. People think that sometimes an attack happens in, you know, in a matter of like an hour. No, usually attack starts uh, and build up until they get to what they want. And sometimes it can take days and even months until they get to what they want. And usually they start from some of these devices as an entry point. So if you can detect it early, you can stop it before there is a damage. And in order to see into what happens in the field, to have these sensors that gives you this data, you need to have a very good connectivity and you need to have the bandwidth to send this data so you could process it. And this is what 5G gives you, because if today you are operating a device in the field and it has only a bandwidth of few kilobytes and it needs to send this data and that's only what it can do, you cannot get a lot of diagnostic data from these devices because it cannot do that. But with 5G, you can get much more data that will help you detect this attack earlier. Nicole, in the last uh, about a minute, what's the most common pitfall you see corporations make? I know you mentioned the, uh, you all mentioned the laziest point of entry, the weakest link. Any other, any other lasting thoughts? I, I think uh, th the idea that you can keep the bad guy out is just an antiquated concept, uh, and the and the fact that you just can't throw enough human bodies at the problem, right? And I think. AI and machine learning has come a, a, along at the right time from a commercialization perspective. And I think it's one of the ways that it's going to help us be able to see this mass amount of devices and sensors and data flowing over 5G and, and keep us safer. 
Well, that concludes our program. Uh, let's give a warm round of applause for our speakers. Really fascinating.